Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me get this thing all going here, if I'm alive. Okay. So, thank you everybody for coming to see and visit and hear my presentation about you landed at the wrong airport. <laughs> so, uh, once again, thank you for the 99s, the family, the friends, the neighbors, and everybody that's helping, especially Paul. He puts all this, Paul Trainer puts all this IT stuff together for me, so I don't have to wrap my mind to even try to turn it on. Um, he, he puts a lot of time and energy in here to help me set these things up. So, uh, yes, landing at the wrong airport, it does happen. It has happened since the 1950s. Excuse me while the airplane goes by. And the, the situations that I'm going to describe tonight are strictly airline type situations. So these, these are guys that are highly trained pilots, 10,000, 20,000 hour pilots. They're not flying your Cherokees, they're not flying the Piper Cubs. They're flying anywhere from BC-8s to 727s to 747s all over the place. And there's many situations that I'm not even going to get into that happen in, in Europe, just probably just as many in the United States. But it, 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 like I said, it's amazing with the amount of technology that they got in the airplane, the experience level of the pilot's concern, the experience level and the equipment that the air traffic controllers have at their disposal, at their disposal. There's many situations where I won't say the air traffic controller contributed to the situation, but it sure didn't help the situation. Mm -hmm. And so I have a couple of audios where you get to hear some of the exchange of information between the pilot and the controller. And in a way, it's kind of funny. Now, and thank goodness, none of these situations that, that I want to describe have happened where anybody's gotten hurt. It's just a lot of total embarrassment. There was one situation where the crew was escorted off the airplane and met with some armed guards at an Air Force base because they landed at the wrong place and they got talked to and all kinds of stuff. So that, that's about as scary as it got. <clears throat> but so fortunately, nothing serious happened. Uh, on the serious note, there was a couple guys that lost their jobs, unfortunately. Uh, the couple guys were offered immediate retirement or else. Uh, so they had some of those endings too. And in some, in some instances in the airline industry, because of the unions and stuff like that. If the pilot chooses to resign, then usually no action will be taken against him. But if he stays in and tries to fight the, the situation that he created, it could become, he might have a hard time flying Cherokees later on. So <laughs> it's just one of the things he needs to do. He needs to realize what, what he's done and where he's at, and here's your options that may happen down the road. <clears throat> One of the popular things that happened in 2014, now fortunately that was the last one that happened, so I'm talking roughly a little over four years ago, and it's, it's Southwest, I hate to sound like I'm picking on with what happened with them the other day, unfortunate, uh, but this, this did happen in real time situation. So the flight was on, uh, um, en route from, he'd taken off Chicago Midway, and Midway is a big, hub for Southwest, so they weren't taken out of O'Hare or anything like that. So, uh, Midway's a little airport to the south, uh, up to the south and east of the city of Chicago. So their intention is to go to the Branson Airport, as you know, a lot of entertainment and stuff like that. So it's a very popular site for people to go. And, you know, the, the, I guess the older folks, they like to say it. <laughs> so anyhow, here's your little depiction. I couldn't make the screens any bigger, pictures any bigger than what we... Okay, so this is all the time. So... I'll describe what he's doing. That was 4013, Brad. Sarah, runway 14. So uh, this is actual footage. Helicopter, south. Southwest, southeast, south, 2000 feet. Southwest 2013, we're looking for the hero. Southwest 4013, helicopter is inside. So that's a helicopter down the ground, tells the tower that he sees southwest. Just exchange of traffic. Southwest 4013, go ahead. <laughs> so, what he's done, he's landed at this little airport right here. He's supposed to be landing at this airport right here. Uh, have you landed? 
<laughs> this runway is 7,000 feet long. It's 4,300. The one that he landed on is about 4,000 uh, 4, feet, just barely enough for him to land safely, as he found out. So that was all the other. Okay, so unfortunately, I didn't have the way, we didn't have a way to give you a little floating transcript of how the bike guy came down. But so anyhow, he's coming out of the north over here. And so one of the one of the techniques that the controller can perfectly use, it's perfectly legal, it's in the handbook, it's nothing that they just made up. So the controllers, a lot of days, a lot of the newer controllers <clears throat> think that they're gonna save the pilots some flying time, save some gas, help them be more efficient, blah, 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 blah. The pilot is trained to fly instrument flight rules. He's got a bunch of gadgetry in the airplanes from the GPS to, to the ILS, to the, all kinds of navigational aids in that airplane over, probably in, in a 737, probably over $200,000 worth of navigational equipment. And all the controller would have to do was give him a fix that's out here on his GPS to say cross that fix at or above a certain altitude, and he would be cleared for the instrument approach to runway 14 down here at uh, Branson. He could fly the instrument approach basically hands off. The airplane knows exactly what to do. It's already pre-programmed from midway. Uh, so it's not nothing that's any guesswork. It's already predetermined. He's got maps sitting in front of him as well. Uh, well, in some cases, some electronic maps. So uh, he's up there. And so it's kind of at nighttime. So the pilot, the crew, quote unquote, are tired. So in a lot of the aviation world, you hear a lot of uh, terms like fatigue and things like that, and tired, long day. Uh, just like anybody's busy day, but now they're they're anxious to get to the last airport to drop the people off, so they can go home to uh, take a nap before they fly again. So, anyhow, he's coming from the north up here, and so the controller has asked him. You heard him say, "Cleared for the visual approach to runway 14." So, one of the requirements on a visual approach uh, uh, that from the controller, he asked the pilot, "Do you see the airport?" Why? I don't know. I, uh, when I was a supervisor in the F, that drove me crazy when I heard that term. It's like don't talk so much because the controllers typically these days are under a lot of scrutiny um, for uh, safety purposes. So every time they open their mouth and say something, if it's not right and something happens, they can be criticized, the FA can be criticized, and to, sometimes to a minor point, sometimes to a very serious point. So anyhow, the less you say in the air traffic control world, the better it can be for both parties. The pilot has understood his clearance. You, the controller, has un have understood the clearance that you've given him and what you're expecting him to do. No guesswork on anybody's part. So, once again, he's up here. He says, do you see the airport? And so at nighttime, and, and we, I know we've got a lot of pilots in the thing, and at nighttime, you're up there about six or 7,000 feet. And, oh, yeah, I see a runway down there. And you, at the time, you say, okay, that's, yeah, that's it, down there. And so you get an agreement between, oh, yeah, yeah, that's it, okay. So here they go. And so the other audio that you heard in there, you heard uh, the, there's an air traffic controller sitting with a radar scope. That's the kind of like the job that I used to do, not the control tower. But he's sitting in his radar scope and he sees where Southwest is at. So now the exchange of information, he calls Branson Tower that's down here. He says, okay, he says, uh, whatever, he said 16 miles northeast of you is Southwest 4013. 40, and so the tower says, I got him in sight. So now he's got him in sight not only visually, he can, see, he can see the lights blinking out there, but he's got another type of radar display called a BRIGHT. That's just an acronym for something. It's a, it's a shorter range uh, scope that sits up above his head. And it, so he's not looking down like this. He can look out and he can, look, he can scan the skies while he's doing. So he sees the target on the scope up there and he can look out and see the airplane as it's come down. So, and then you heard a few seconds later, uh, we're on the ground now. And so Branson Tower, now, once again, on the controller side, Branson Tower should have been able to look out that window and say, you're not going to the right place. He had plenty of time because the guy is out of 6,000 feet or so, so he has to descend another five or 6,000 feet just to get down to the runway. So you're talking a couple minutes of flight and like, okay, what was the controller doing? And unfortunately, some of my reports, I can't see into the FAA's investigation to say, what was that guy doing? What was he not doing? by not giving him information because that's his job. And we'll see in a couple other situations where that's very critical for the guy to say, you're lined up for the wrong runway. You're not doing what you've been told. 
And so once again, it could become critical, it could become dangerous, it could become deadly if something happened. Fortunately, nothing happened. So, um, so he turns around and lands at the airport. So the, air, the runway is approximately 4,000 feet. And so now, the, like I described earlier, the runway down here is about 7,000 feet. So you're coming in at 737, you've got a final approach speed about 125 knots, so everything's looking good. The pilots, and they've got 100, oh, I think 122 passengers on the airplane. I think it seats like 140, so they had a pretty, a pretty full boat. And so the pilots on their landing, and they're going through their checklist just like a normal landing. Da, 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 there's the runway, got the runway inside. They're, so all the bells and whistles going off, flaps coming down, the gears coming down, just, just like, you know, normal business. And he touches down. Now all of a sudden he sees the runway, the end of the runway coming up real quick at him. So now he's on the brakes. And when they get on the brakes harder than normal, the airplane can kind of shudder like that in front. And so I can imagine his teeth going like that. So he's at the end of the runway. He says, He's got about 100 feet left. So off the end of the runway was probably some mud, <laughs> and they would have had a real hard time getting him out of there, and he would have even more explaining to do how he got in the mud. So now you heard the exchange, uh, where we think we're at the wrong airport. So sure enough, so in the meantime, like I said, I highly critical, and yes, I know it, but, but that guy at the Branson Towers had plenty of time to say, I don't think you're going to the right airport. And he could have saved the whole situation right there, and he could have been, he could have probably been the hero. They would have had him on 2020 or something like that. Oh, how did you see that? But anyhow, that's the equipment that they've got. And little airports, the little airports like that, and the great big airports, they've got all kinds of electronic data to provide them information to tell that pilot, okay, you're messing up, okay? And so we'll talk about it on the ground, but you're messing up right now. <clears throat> but once again, on the quote visual approach, the, the air traffic control is perfectly legal in offering it to the pilot. The pilot can deny it. Says no, we'll just stay on the instruments. We see the airport, but he can push that that autopilot button. You've heard of that, and the airplane you can take your hands off of it and it'll fly it down to the runway if you if you want it to. Okay, so it's that quote unquote simple. Uh, so the what they had to do was up here at the this is what what they call Graham Airport, actually, uh, that airport. So then Southwest has to call his dispatch people and say, okay, we got a little situation. <laughs> so they had to send some buses up from, from Branson, pick the passengers up, send another cargo truck or something, bring the, the, the uh, luggage, because there was no way that the airplane was gonna be able to get off that runway safely with that kind of weight, 120 odd, some odd people, and their bags, they couldn't do it safely. So. That's one thing. So they got the Branson just kind of sideways. So they get the Branson, and then the crew had to fly the airplane out. So it could take off pretty easily in 3,500 feet of runway. And so he had to just make a short little hop to get back down here. So last I heard, one of the crew members, one of the pilots decided, I think I'm going to resign <laughs> just to avoid all the paperwork mess that he may be involving. And over time period, I guess, there has been a couple of people who have sued Southwest for stress or trauma or something. I don't know what the term was, and I guess there's like $100,000 a piece and somebody, about five or six people decided to sue Southwest. Where that suit is, I don't know. The other guy, I think, uh, stood by the union and I think he was offered some remedial training, and I don't know if he's sweeping floors or cleaning up desks now, but he's still employed last I heard. So that's just kind of some of the things that happen. And even though it sounds kind of funny, yes, sir. Did the Hollister Airport have a tower or was no, it a unicorn? No, that was an uncontrolled airport. Uncontrolled. So in, in that region, there's a lot of little tiny airports and stuff like that. But it has a parallel runway feature that up here at night, when the guy's coming southbound, he says, oh, yeah, I see it. I just, he just looks off his right side, even though down, down the road, just about 10 or 12 miles, here's this another airport that's where he was supposed to be going. So there's many airports across the United States that do not have control towers. Many of them are big airports. So, but yeah, a good question because a lot of people wonder, well, okay, why, why isn't the control tower? But like I said, they made the communication just like they were supposed to. They did the coordination to say, okay, here's who he is and what he's doing. But my little pain is he didn't have to be on a visual approach. He could let the pilot fly the airplane and let all the gadgetry do the job that it's designed to do. Uh, because that's why they did it. They, 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 back in the uh, 
late 80s, they started developing all these GPS equipment, things like that. Basically, where the pilot could just cover his eyes and the airplane could go all by itself. You didn't even have to touch it. Yes, sir. So how come they didn't catch it on the radar or catch that, it on the yes, radar? Yes, yes, I understand. And that was one of the things I couldn't see in the investigation as to what the controller's statement. Because whenever there's a situation, whether it's a, a semi-minor thing like that, or if two airplanes have gotten too close, they have an investigation. You know, ask the controller, what were you doing? Were you reading? Were you, did you have your feet up on the console? Why didn't you see that happen? And sometimes it puts, you know, so now the controller, and, and I know I sound like my anti-union, but now he has to go through his union representative to say, okay, what do I say here? Without lying, because they you know, naturally get in trouble for lying. <clears throat> but so they have to be very brief in their statements, try to cover the situation, but they try to make it as brief as possible. So what he told the investigators, I don't know that part. But it, <laughs> it still didn't solve the situation. Yes, sir. Did the Branson Airport have a poke strobe light? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like I said, from the pilot experience of looking down to seeing that airport, they sell that first one off to the right. Oh yeah, yeah we got inside. So it has parallel runways, but like I said, the runways were one's almost four thousand feet, the other one's seven thousand feet. So he just saw what, and, and so why they, the, the pilots had an agreement. They, okay, we see the runway, and I'm just kind of astounded. Both of them, you know, I don't see that one. I see a different runway, but. Nonetheless, that's what happened. <clears throat> so, did I somebody did go over that pretty good? Okay, just let me know and I'll go back and re reset. So, next little situation happened in 2013. So it happened just a few months prior to the Southwest thing. And so this is, uh, as you can see, right before Thanksgiving and the airplane had taken off New York, big 747. This thing's called the Boeing Dreamlifter. You'll see a picture of it here in a second. And what it is, it's flown by a company called Atlas, which has a lot of charter work, a lot of contract work with the government and various things. So the Dreamlifter itself is a modified 747, and it is, it is uh, modified to carry parts of the Boeing 787. Okay? And the Boeing 787 is manufactured in several cities around the United States. And so as different components get put together, the, 787, the 747 comes in, takes the parts, takes it to the next place. So one of the flights that they had to make was it started way out, way out in New York. So if I think the time period was like 10 o'clock at night, nice clear <laughs> night in Kansas. <clears throat> so his, me, his intended airport was McConnell Air Force Base in Kansas. You've got three parallel runways. They're about almost 10,000 feet long a piece. So even for the general aviation pilot, not to be a slam or something, they should have been pretty easy to see. Okay, now, you'll see on a couple maps, it's a very tricky area because there's a lot of smaller general aviation airports in the vicinity, but once again, the pilot has 20,000 hours of flying time. He's got gadgets upon gadgets upon gadgets that could have took him right to the runway and he wouldn't have done a thing. But the controller had to say, do you see the airport? So, so that's what a dream lifter looks like. That's on the little airport that it landed on. Um, 747, as you can see, it's kind of modified from right here to the back and all it does it doesn't haul passengers or anything like that strictly parts and components of the 787 dreamliner they call it uh, to for assembly <clears throat> so the airplane fully loaded probably that airplane is right around a little over 300,000 pounds which is, for 747 isn't really that much but it was just a lot of bulky cargo you know, it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't lead or nothing like that so um, that's where he ended up so the our flying public kind of knows what what the approach plate looks like so we're no point here so here's all these little up and down arrows right here are runways airports so there's one there one there one there and this is where he was supposed to be going i said three runways but they got two parallel runways right there McConnell. so why he ended up going to this airport called jabara colonel jabara airfield i have no idea because, like I said, his airplane was programmed since he left New York to go to McConnell on this particular route that air, they, they fly all the time. It was nothing that they just made up. It's a route that's flown many times. The controller, when he was about 20 miles to the north, he should have been able to say, clear for ILS approach to runway 19 left and let the pilot fly the airplane to the runway or let the machine fly the airplane to the runway. Second of all, the, the tower controller at McConnell that is a military base, military controllers. 
And that guy, once again, they're all required to be looking out the window because that's their job, that's what they get paid to do. They have this electronic thing up in the, up in the top of their cab where they get the electronic data, they got, it's alphanumerics, just like you see on your, your uh, computers at home, same type of alphanumerics, and it's moving along. It tells the pilot, it tells the control his speed, tells him his altitude, tells him everything that he needs to know right there. Basically the same thing that the pilot's looking at on the, on the front of his dashboard, okay? So, so anyhow, he gets out there, and that is another one on this way. What happened to my Jabara field at the There it is. Okay, there. So, he ends up landing at this runway right here. This was his intended runway. And so is that thing an audio? Yeah, it's going to come So out. it's going to start talking in a few seconds. Power back, uh, 42, uh, 41, heavy is on a bit, or on that GPS the pilot's already confused right there. Okay, one left, third line. So he's roughly about 15 miles out. Seven fourteen forty forty two forty one. We might uh we'll get back to you here momentarily. We're not on your boat. Seven fourteen forty one heavy in the pile is a nine mile stuff. Uh yes sir. We just landed at the other airport. Okay. We just landed at the other airport. Seven fourteen forty one heavy in the pile. Uh apparently uh we've uh landed at B the show. He thinks he's at the beach airport, which is up here. He don't even know where he's at. He thinks so. He thinks so. Giant 4241 heavy McConnell, you are full time and landed and stopped at the EDC airport. Giant 4241 heavy McConnell, are you able to make a first direction of departure off that airport and back in the airport for McConnell? We're working on those details now, sir. Roger. And Connell, uh, Tower, Giant 4241. Giant 4241, Is there a power frequency here for the Giant 4241, heavy, uh, speech tower is actually closed at this, this time, uh, on the end. Is there a unicom frequency? Giant 4241, heavy, Giant. He's asking for a unicom frequency, which is a common frequency to talk. For this, uh, for the airport? Okay, uh, 4241 He's reading in the latitude and longitude of the beach airport. So the guy's not even at the beach airport. <laughs> Four one six four. Okay, east uh, nine two one two nine uh, zero. Uh, west nine seven degrees one two point nine zero. Sorry, that's the way my hand went. West nine two one two decimal nine zero. West nine seven one two decimal nine zero. Okay, 
giant force two four one heavy from the uh, target we saw on the radar scope. Uh, you were over top, so the target was over top of the Guara Airport, which is approximately eight miles north of the Hama Airport. Intercom for this is one two two point seven. Say again, one two two point seven. All right, uh, this gentleman, uh, this team has the frequency. We're going to try it on one two two seven as well. And a final tower, giant four two four. Yes, sir. We're on uh, police contact with the company right now. We're uh, at, uh, getting an analyzed total performance status. Guys, 4241 heavy, right? Guys, 4241 heavy, and so you know which airport you're at. Well, we think we have a pretty good pulse. Uh, how many minutes? Let me ask you this. How many airports do directly to the south of 19? Uh, you're 19. Are uh, there? Giant 4241 Heavy, uh, you're currently north of the tunnel and it is 3 along the outpost. Sorry, I know I thought, sorry, I wasn't, something else. Uh, we are, we're showing about 6 miles north of the tunnel. Okay, thanks. Uh, we just had a twin engine aircraft, a uh, turbo pump aircraft go over the top of it. Because he couldn't land. Uh, <laughs> 4241 Heavy, Roger, you, uh, it appears that you have spot. Uh, thank you. Giant 4241 Heavy, uh, we saw the plane on the radar, and it appears that you have to buy it. Thank you. Did you borrow it? Did you borrow it? Giant 4241 heavy, that's J A E A R R A. Okay, alright, uh, we'll copy that. Okay, uh, we'll also show that uh, we're just short of uh, about a mile short of war right now. Giant 4241 heavy, Roger, yes, yeah, that's the bottom. And the uh, tunnel power, uh, Giant 4241. Giant 4241 heavy, Yes, sir. It looks like we do confirm that it is Jabbar. Giant 4241, heavy right. And Giant 4241, heavy right. We're talking to the company now. We're trying to uh, assess our uh, performance situation as far as uh, being able to leave this airport up to you. Giant 4241, heavy right. We're trying to keep it to the right. As you can see, a lot of exchange of, I don't know, you don't know. It took them several minutes to determine where that, where that big seven foot, what took several minutes for that pilot to determine where he was at. Uh, very embarrassing for him as well. So the runway at Jabara, Jabara that's what he's talking about. He, he was talking about the identifier. So that's the identifier on, on your navigational systems for your ILS. It's AAO was the airport identifier. So why he, he didn't have AAO in there. So how he ended up at that airport, I still would love to see the further reports on that. So. Um, why he chose to take off the autopilot and land at this place, I still don't know that part. I haven't been able to dig that deep into this investigation. But, uh, so at a General Aviation Airport, there's different runway strengths and how heavy of an airplane it can take without cracking the runway. Okay, so this guy was extremely lucky weighing over 300,000 pounds that he didn't crack some form of that concrete when he landed. Okay, so he must have made a pretty good smooth landing. He had just enough runway to stop, because he was probably looking at the fences at the far end. 
the, see, there was, okay, I'm going to go through the fence here in a second. So he's out there looking, and, and somebody's down on the ground flagging him, saying, what are you doing here? Because you know, for, for the corn farmers out there, that was a big event. See, it was a big airplane out there for them. Uh, and then the guy at uh, McConnell's just not helping much. So when the airplane landed on their, on their FMS, their flight management system, they have, just like in your GPS in your cars, it tells you your latitude and longitude. So why it was taking him so long to come out with the latitude and longitude, I don't know the, what was, I'm sure he was very nervous, to say the least. And so anyhow, the cargo was not damaged, nobody was hurt, just a lot of embarrassment. And the, the, the captain for this flight was offered immediate retirement or else. The co-pilot was offered extensive training. And I think he's now out of the bathroom detail. He's back in the front office <laughs> flying the airplanes. But, uh, uh, so, like I said, embarrassing situations on the military side of this thing. Once again, they've got this thing up in the thing that's about three or four feet away from that guy's face, and he should be able to look at that and look out to the sky and say, okay, you're not lined up to one nine left. And where are you going? Would have saved the situation. It would put a question to the said, okay, I'm going to land. Oh, no, I'm not. So he, he would have time to pull out pull the flaps up, add some power, and get to the runway. So now he's stuck with that, that weighted airplane on that runway. He doesn't have, when he's talking about the numbers, he was checking with his company to see if he had the numbers, weight-wise, performance-wise, of the airplane to get off that runway safely, and he didn't. So what they had to do later on, the uh, next day, they had to send some trucks, 18-wheelers out there, take the cargo off, put on the 18-wheelers, and then roll it down the highway here to McConnell. And then later on, the airplane was light enough to be able to just barely clear the fences there at Jabbar and get it up in the air just for a minute or so to land safely on, uh, on one nine left. Except they had to call in, <clears throat> excuse me, they had to call in another crew to fly the airplane because the other ones didn't have a job at that time. <laughs> so, big airplane, big airport, and it's like, how could you miss it type thing, but somebody did. And there was opportunity for that controller to say, you did something wrong, we got a problem, we got something going on here, we need to fix it right now. But they didn't, okay? So, like I said, just an embarrassing factor. And once again, these guys had, the captain had over 20,000 hours of flying time. Co-pilot was like right around 10 or 12,000 hours, so it wasn't like they were brand new to this game. And, they, and these guys fly all over the world. It's not like they just fly these little cow towns. They, they fly to Germany a lot of times for, these, for the assembly for some of these airplanes. Okay, so here's another cute little situation, Delta Airlines, and this happened in 2015, I'm not sure the exact year. So the two airports that was concerned here was, oops, was uh, Rapid City Airport in South Dakota, beautiful downtown South Dakota, and Ellsworth Air Force Base. Ellsworth Air Force Base is a, is a very heavily armed base. It's not something that you just go walking into without having guns pointed at your face because they have a lot of fighters, they have a lot of bombers. I'm sure they carry some nukes in those airplanes that are around the sidelines. Uh, so, here's the, kind of the layout of the runway situation where the pilot was supposed to land. And so there's another depiction of here in a second. And so he was supposed to make an approach to runway 14, just like on the other thing, okay? So the, the runways are number 1480 degrees from that is 32. This is a short runway here, but he's supposed to come into 14. Okay, on a 140 heading is, yes, sir? Uh, or the aliens got them, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so that was brought up, by the way. So, um, so Rapid City, South Dakota, you're flying in a Delta Airbus, which used to be owned by Northwest, but now Delta owns that company. You're flying from Minneapolis, which is, I think it's a 300 mile flight or less. And so you're, You've left beautiful downtown Minneapolis in the winter, and you want to go down to Minneapolis or South Dakota where it's colder. <laughs> so to see the grandkids, see whoever family. So that's where you think you're going in this airplane. You, you're on a flight, you're talking to your, uh, everybody, you're, oh, we're going to go see Grandma and Grandpa, have a good time, and you're going to end up in an Air Force base with guns pointed at you in a few seconds. So now we don't have audio for this one. So, okay, so here's the. The, one of the approach plates that the pilot looks at in a lot of smaller airplanes, it's a paper version, of this chart in the, in the newer, in the new, uh, many of the newer airplanes, 
they have what they call e-flight bags. It's electronic information that's on their chart. It's about yay big, and it's very easy for them to look at, but this is, this is what it looks like in, in paper form. So this is an Air Force base right here. Okay, This is a fix. All these little star-looking things are RNAV GPS fixes. It's on, on his FMS that he's looking at almost like your, your screen on your car that you, your airplane's going to fly over that waypoint. I'm sure you've heard of the waypoints along the way. So that's a waypoint on this approach. So the controller was a military controller. I hate the bag of the military, but it was a military installation that runs the approach control into that airport. So he could have said, <clears throat> excuse me, he could have said cross that fix at a certain altitude, pilot pushes autopilot, airplane flies to the runway, no questions asked. On the, uh, there's a term that I'm trying to think of, it's kind of like an advisory on the approach plate that the pilot has to be looking at. It says, caution, there's an Air Force base nearby. Just a heads up, okay? So this pilot, the captain, had never flown. He's been flying 18 years for, for Delta, or he was flying for Delta. Uh, for 18 years, he had never been in this airport. Why? I don't know. But that was not one of his things that he had ever been on to, to fly into. So anyhow, he could say, cross that fix right there, cleared for the approach to 1-4, and cross. That's a, that's a little waypoint right there. That's a little waypoint right there. He's coming in from the north, uh, from that section. And so that's about 12 or 13 miles right there of flying. And he would have touched down perfectly at the end of the runway and met at the gate, seen mom and pa and grandpa and everybody like that. But now he's met by armed forces, okay? So uh, later on, let me see if I can picture here. Okay, so here's a little bit blown up view. So here's the airport that he's supposed to go into. Here's Ellsworth Air Force Base. So in the tape, I didn't get the chance to copy that tape, but in the tape recording, Pilots, or excuse me, the controller says, do you see the airport? Okay, so part of the problem that, or uh, trigger, I guess, maybe not a problem, is when the controllers see that the pilot is slightly high on an arrival to an airport, they'll, uh, they think they're offering help, but all the communication that they're doing, they could, instead of saying, do you see the airport and all that nonsense, they could have said, descend and maintain, give the pilot a chance to descend the airplane, help him come into a more comfortable approach and not have to, listen to some other chatter on the radio that, that they're ultimately going to get in trouble for in, in this scenario. So the pilot was a little bit high, a little bit fast, because uh, it could have been late planning on the controller's part, late planning on the pilot's part. It's hard to determine right now without seeing the, the actual replay as to what whose part played what. So, but nonetheless, oops, yeah, there's a shot. So anyhow, the pilot's coming in from this direction. Once again, this is, like I said, a blown up view. So he says, do you see the airport? So he thinks he's helping out the pilot. Pilot says, yeah, see it. it's right down there. He says, clear visual approach to runway 1-4. Okay, here is magic 1-4 again. So he comes in, and so he gets about out here, and he's like, oh, there's a runway right there. That's the biggest runway to me. I don't need to go. <laughs> so what, what they were thinking, but they had, they had, and so in these airline crews, they have to have agreement between the two pods. Yes, I see the runway. Yes, I see the runway. When I, when I say I see the runway, which runway do I see? Do I see Ellsworth or do I see that big Air Force base? I mean, a Rapid City or that Air Force base. So in this case, I'm sure the exchange of, yes, I see, yeah, I see the airport. You know. So apparently they didn't see the right one. So all these other little gadgets on here that you see looks like little TP are just you know, what they call uh, obstructions. So they're nothing secret. It's just obstructions. If you had to fly out here, you had to make sure you're above 4,410 uh, feet so you don't hit that little power line or that mountain or whatever's out there. That's what those are. This extra gadget, these numbers, right at 14.7, that tells the pilot from that particular fix there on his GPS to the runway is, is 14.7 miles. That's the heading to select on his select mode, 144 degrees to get into the runway. So he's looking at all the gadgets, all this stuff that he's got to navigate on, but he chooses to take a visual. Okay, 4,900 feet is the altitude that he's gonna maintain uh, at that point along that route to, to that one, and then he's gonna start descending. <clears throat> So, um, so that's just some basic stuff that he's looking at. The airplane is programmed to fly this. It's not nothing that they have to, all of a sudden, now they can manually load it if they had to, but it is programmed because it's one of their, one of their airports in their system. So all the airports are loaded and they just have to dial in Rapid City, they have to dial whatever airport they're going to, boom, and the route shows up. 
And if there's any modifications to it, then the air traffic controller will give them modifications as they need. So, and here's a little bit more graphic thing. So here's, here's Ellsworth Air Force Base out here, and here's the intended airport right here. Okay, this is where he's supposed to land. And so he gets out there and says, oh yeah, I see the airport. So the guy says, clear for visual approach. Now, once again, if the controller had not have said that, we wouldn't even be talking about it. Okay, so the controller is supposed to be looking out the window, just like I described before. He's got that little round scope that's about three or four feet away from his head. He had plenty of opportunity to say, you know, something's not right. Okay, it's very simple exchange of information. And what to say the situation, another thing where a pilot, uh, or another situation where the controller saved the day type deal. Okay, so there, the, and, and uh, on the tape, the, the Rapid City Tower says, clear to land runway 14. Pilot says, Roger. And so now the time this guy is looking at on his radar, he's, he should have been looking out the window what he was doing, I don't know to this day. And so now the pilot gets out here very short, finally he's got the airplane configured to land, he's very slow, everything's looking good, he's talking to himself and part of the transcript that, that I think I have in here, he's talking about oh, how great of a landing this is and I'm on it. And then all of a sudden he's down about 50 feet off the runway, he's discovered, this ain't the right airport. <laughs> so there's about 72 explicatives on the tape that you can't hear of them not saying too nice of things to each other and who knows what else? It's not Starbucks, I guarantee you. And, uh, <clears throat> So now they're there, and the pilot chooses to land as opposed to endanger the crew, endanger the airplane, endanger the, the passengers by trying to abort the, the landing and take back off. Because it could become, it could have become dangerous. Don't know. There wasn't any significant wind out there to create any anything, any great concern. But he chose to land. So he chose to land. He gets to the end of the runway. He says, "Ladies and gentlemen," he says, "That was one of the best landings I ever had." He says, "However, we're at the wrong airport." <laughs> so, and, and so I don't have the audio. I have I have the printout somewhere in here. I'll, I'll try to find it here in a second. So he tells but and so the now the and it's a funny exchange of the the tower and the uh, and the pilot. He says, uh, "So North, or Delta Radio is the control tower." He says, "Well, he says not sure where I'm at, but he says I'm here on runway. Uh, this is not runway one four here. This is a slightly different runway." And uh, Choi says, uh, yes, sir. He says, I see where you're at. He says, you're going to have to taxi forward, pull off to the taxiway. He says, you're going to be met by security. And these are guys that don't play games with their little whatever kind of weapons they're carrying. And they're up there, and they take this stuff very serious. They don't, they don't think it's a laughing matter, regardless if it says Delta Airlines on the side of the airplane. And you got a bunch of people wanting to see grandma and grandpa on the back of the airplane. They don't really care, because they, they may think, OK, this is not a drill. These are terrorists, you know. That's the way some of these guys think. So, anyhow, they open up the, the doors to the airplane, or the door to the airplane, and these guys with these, you can picture standing right here with their, bayonet, or their, their hats on, and, okay, who's in charge of this thing? <laughs> so, I said, I am. So he's come here with me. So they escort the crew off the airplane, and so now they, they have to radio to Delta Airlines. <laughs> We got a little situation here. We need another crew to come in and fly the airplane out of here. So it took them about six or eight hours to investigate, to interview passengers, crew members, and stuff like that to determine that they weren't terrorists, that they just wanted to get to, to Rapid City, South Dakota, of all places. <laughs> I thought a better place than I might try to divert to, but that's, that's where they had to go. But so, once again, total embarrassment. Once again, if the control had said not anything about a visual approach and just left the pilot alone on his pre programmed root his instruments would have taken him he could close his eyes an airplane has the technology put him right on the runway even though legally they can't do that but it has the capability of doing something <clears throat> um, no one? okay so this is from back in the 70s this is a 747 again this is a military 747 it's a it's if you ever heard the term of AWACS airborne warning and command it's that type of airplane military thing so uh, once again controller Military controller says, do you see the airport? Pilot says, yeah. So he's supposed to be landing up here, and I can't never pr pronounce that, Patuxent River Airport, but that's where he's supposed to be going. He says, he looks down here, and the crew says, oh, yeah, we see the airport. They see this thing. And so now this is a 747 on training mission, and I don't know what kind of grades they got on this particular mission, but it probably wasn't good. Once again, this is back, and I couldn't get tapes off this because it happened several years ago. So... Um, 
kind of, like I said, totally embarrassment on many of these situations. Uh, I don't think I have a map for this one. Oh, okay, here's a Q1. So, and, oh, by the way, that's not cannabis airport. That's actually cabinets <laughs> in this day and age of cabinets. Um, so anyhow, the, uh, uh, who's this? Continental, Continental Airlines, flying in the Corpus Christi, Texas. He's supposed to be going to Corpus, which is right up there. For whatever reason, he says, and, and this guy was on the instrument approach. He was flying what he thought was the instrument approach to a parallel, uh, same runway lineup as it's Corpus Christi, and he's and so in, in the crews talking to each other. Oh yeah, we see the airport. Okay, we got this. We got the we got the, the altitudes met <clears throat> on the approach way. We're cooking with gas, and next thing you know, we're at the wrong airport. Okay. So once again, the the controller should have been able to say, "Hey, dude, you're lined up in the wrong place," because they got a scope. They're sitting there, things going, uh, making 14, 14 sweeps a minute. So this is not nothing that's going to put you to sleep. There's activity going on all over that thing, and he should say. Comment on where you're going, but he did not on a visual approach type thing. But controller, I ask, was he doing his job? Did he do his job? Uh, nobody got hurt, just scared to death. And fortunate, fortunate this little cabinous field. It was an auxiliary, I think, Navy field at one time. So nobody got hurt, just scared the crap out of them. Uh, but nobody met them with guns or nothing like that. They just kind of embarrassing. Had to turn around. They had enough gas to get back up in the air later on and get back to that airport. So, once again, some of this stuff makes the news pretty good. Some of it they are pretty good about keeping it squelched. Um, here's a situation back with good old Delta, back in 1987. This is this one. This happened. The pilot takes off Louisville, Kentucky. I know it looks a little blurry there. That blue didn't show up too good. And his intended landing is over here in Lexington. Okay. So a little bit of stormy weather this particular afternoon. And very busy time for Delta in this, in this 1987 time period. I'll describe another scenario here that, he, that they were facing, and, and they had a lot of media attention because of both incidences at the time. <clears throat> it takes off a of Louisville controller, says, do you see the airport going to Lexington? And so Delta, so if you've ever had the pleasure of being able to fly in the weather and get bounced around by the airport, so the pilot's trying to jockey around the clouds and not want to upset the passengers. And all. He says, oh, yeah, I see it down there. So he looks out the window. But he sees beautiful downtown Frankfort, Kentucky. He lands at Frankfort, even though where he's supposed to go is beautiful downtown Lexington. So once again, a little exchange of uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've had a nice landing, but we're at the wrong airport. So Delta kept it very squelched. They didn't make any stink about it because they had some other issues going on in Los Angeles. And this particular situation was not landing at the wrong airport, but yours truly was having to work this particular airplane. He was coming out of LA. He was nonstop to Cincinnati, almost a brand new 767 at the time. The airplane takes off. Control tower says contact the radar departure controller, which that's what I was doing. So I identify the airplane on my alphanumerics of the things that I was watching. So the, airport, the pilot checks in with me. He says, we're climbing out of 2,000 for 15,000, da, 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 da. So I, I had all the data. I knew what he was doing. And so I, we exchange our, our information on each other. And so now I'm watching the scope. And not only do I have that airplane, I've got about five or six others that I've got to be tending to. And so all of a sudden I notice on his, his uh, you've heard of mode C, altitude readout, altitude encoding, many of the pilots are familiar with it. So all of a sudden <clears throat> I look down and I see 22, 21, 2. 19, 18. Now the Pacific Ocean is right off his nose. He's already over the ocean, so now he's looking for sharks. And so now, 1,700 feet and your nose is pointed down is not a very good sign. And especially what, what they've done, what they did wrong. So my heart jumped, and I'm like, I was, it was kind of hard for me to even say. I said, Delta 810, I said, are you okay? And silence. I'm like, no, come on. And I just went through an airplane accident in 1986 involving Aeromexico, if you remember that, back in Cerritos on August 31st. So I, so my heart jumped. I'm like, come on, not again. So, and he didn't answer me. So now I see 1,500, 1,400. Now there's bells and whistles going off on my end. So now it alerts me. It's called low altitude alert, which is a function that many of these controllers should have seen on their scopes to begin with on these other situations to alert the pilot 
I've got a low altitude alert on you. Something's the matter from what I see. Okay. And so anyhow, I gave him the information. I said, low altitude alert. And he says, uh, Delta 10 Roger. And he says, we're working on it. I'm like, so now i got to alert my supervisor, and everybody's kind of gathering uh, what's going to happen here. And so I, I, all kinds of things going through my head. I'm like, why do I have to go through two of these in one year? So anyhow, he says, okay, we're back with you. And all of a sudden, I see 1,400, 1,500, 1,600. So now he's climbing like nobody's business. So I get him turned on his route. So he's so I called the tower and said, stop your departures. I don't need to be messing with other airplanes when this guy's having a hard time. Whatever he's doing, wrong, okay? So um, so I get him established on his route. He's, got, he's out of the Pacific Ocean, so he's not going to make a big sweeping turn back to start hitting the eastbound. So this is long before computers, cell phones, gadgetry, and stuff like that. So what had happened, and if you can imagine flying as a passenger, I'm sure many times, the, somebody in the airplane, this is almost a brand new 767 at the time. So they're climbing out, and what they like to do at the time is they, they, one guy pushes the throttles and holds them there on their, on their departure climb, and the other guy is just sitting there and drinking his coffee or whatever he's doing. So somebody on the, on the right side of the console and sits in the middle had itchy fingers that day or something and accidentally pulled some switches and it cut the power off to the engines. Okay. So now you're in a tube. It's not making any noise. It's definitely quiet. It's just going... And nobody's saying nothing. The, the pilot, by rules, should have said, prepare for impact. Because it could have been. Just a few more seconds, boom, they could have been there. Okay? So he didn't tell nobody nothing. They just kind of, okay, we don't say So on the back, people are like, and they don't know what to do because it can't, you can't say, I want out. <laughs> you know? So they go on to Cincinnati. So then in the meantime, I'm sitting here making out a statement, what, what I did, what I had to do to keep this guy not from hitting the ocean. And so I'm making my statement. So now this information is being transmitted, if you will, transmitted, not, not an email, it was <laughs> telegraph, if you will, uh, to Washington, D.C. to be sent to Cincinnati to say, okay, when that crew gets on the ground, they're going to be talked to. So as they open the door, got some investigators in suits, shows their ID, uh, you need to come talk with us. So that day, both crew members got fired. There was a pilot and a co-pilot got fired because they admitted they turned off the engines accidentally. Naturally, you wouldn't want somebody doing it on purpose. But uh, they... <laughs> So the people in the back were furious because they weren't told anything. They weren't saying, oh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, we did have a little bit of, you know, nothing, no explanatory things about what happened. So Cincinnati is, what, three and a half hour flight from, or four hours from, from L.A., give or take. And so, like I said, Delta had a lot of things on their hand. And then this thing happens, uh, this particular scenario here with, in Louisville and uh, Frankfurt. Uh, so, like I said, it was, it was yes, a scary situation for myself because, like I said, I didn't want to have to go through another accident because that was taxing enough to go through a mid-air collision to begin with at 32 years old. I didn't, it made me feel like I was 102. Yes, sir. Um, when did the $300,000 for the GPS stuff become widely available? Widely available. It started the, the uh, development and, and training started in the late 80s started implementing in early 90s, mid 90s. By the late 90s, most all type, uh, air carrier type airplanes had this equipment. Today, it's much more advanced than what it started out with, but it's a very cool system. It's very simple to understand. And yeah, and so the, the, it has the technology these days of the old fashioned uh, ground-based navigational systems. It's much more accurate. It is satellite based. The only problem with this stuff called GPS and another reason about navigation, several years ago, this was back in the 90s, I was part of a team and they didn't like me because I was too skeptic, I wasn't the yes guy, and they wanted to take out X percent of ground navigational systems all across the United States to save money, we're gonna save this, we're gonna save that, we're gonna save. And so my limited experience at the time of, of navigation with pilots, controllers, all kinds of things, I'm thinking, they rely on this stuff quite a bit. It, even though it's old-fashioned, it worked very soundly. 
Yes, they had to go out and do maintenance out in 10,000 foot mountains out in the icy cold, but that's what they got paid to do. So I asked a question to the guy that was a leader. I said, okay, we're going to go to an all GPS based navigational system all over the country. The guy said, yeah. And I said, okay. I said, I hate to be the skeptic, but I said, those, the GPS stuff is satellite based. I said, what if, so what if, the Russians, the China, whoever the bad guys are today, gets up there and blows up one of those satellites that have information on all these GPS-based things. I said, what do we do? And everybody's like, so all of a sudden, they scratched that idea. So the, the ground-based navigation systems are still there. So a lot of our smaller pilots, smaller airplanes, still have the capability of the old-fashioned VORs, the nav aids and stuff like that, they can still navigate on. Yes, they're slowly getting the GPS. There used to be a requirement that they had to have certain type of GPS and what they call ADSB, it's a, another form of GPS, by a certain time period. And I think that time period is going to slip again, but there was a criteria one time you had to have it in your airplane. So, um, so to answer your question, it, it, it's very widely used wi around the world. Uh, you can push point and so a long time ago the bigger jets had uh, uh, systems called Loran so on a Loran system you could load up your FMS prior to departure this is very taxing to watch positive so they could only accept the, the system was only designed to accept nine nine waypoints at one time so if you're flying from here to uh, Los Angeles to New York you could pick out nine particular latitude longitude GPS type things along the way and then when the controller says, okay, you can proceed direct so-and-so, they can push the button, and it would show them the coordinates, and the airplane would take off and go by itself. Okay? But you can only have that nine times. So in many other cases, as you got closer towards the airport of your intended landing, the, the controller would take you off of that route because they had to get everybody in one conga line, so to speak, because they didn't want airplanes just going willy-nilly at each other. They had to have some more uh, order of, of pecking once they got into the New York's the Dallas's, the Chicago's, and St. Louis's, and LA's, and stuff like that. So it, it had to be very controlled far out. So it helped, but later on, like I said, it kept developing, and now it's a very sophisticated system. It's still satellite-based, and they still have the ground-based uh, nav systems. But, uh, and, and like I said, it works good, but they still want to refine it more. How much more they're gonna refine it, I don't know, I couldn't tell you, because I've been out of the game for seven years myself. So, um, but I know, I know there's work constantly being done to it. <clears throat> uh, so that was Delta. Okay, that's a so Delta again, well this was pre-Delta, this was Western Airlines. So Western used to be a very popular company out here on the West Coast, or Midwest I should say, and uh, later on they were bought by Delta. So they're supposed to be going to Sheridan Airport up here in Wyoming. All of a sudden they misguide themselves, not even a visual approach type thing. So they end up going to this other little airport called, what was the name of it? Called Buffalo. And it's like, the pilot looks at the co-pilot, where we at? <laughs> so once again, they wouldn't have the hype and the, 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 the uh, technology and all the computers to say, hey, look at what these dummies did. So they just politely refueled the airplane, got it back in the air, and got back to Sherrod. So uh, cool way of saying Wyoming, I guess. So that's not the end of the presentation. That's the end of that. So anyhow, just to give you an idea on, uh, so that other airplane, I, I meant to say that, even though it said uh, Atlas on the side of it, they're calling themselves giants. So that was their radio call sign. Sometimes it's not what it says on the airplane. So it said uh, Atlas on the side of the airplane, but their radio call sign was giant. So anyhow, they're looking at things kind of like this on a, another kind of map that shows the different airports in the region. So it can become quite distracting to somebody, I guess. Um, so it's a military C-17, big cargo jet. Once again, a lot of gadgets, nav systems, a couple pilots in the airplane, plus a couple backup pilots. They're flying from, I'm just gonna say overseas, I think London was somewhere in, in the England area was where they had taken off from. And they're supposed to be going to either Patrick or McDill Air Force Base, one of the two, pretty big Air Force Base down in Florida. So they blame the, the 
and I couldn't, I didn't get to see, catch any of the tapes in this, so I don't know if they were offered the visual approach like I've criticized before. So, uh, they blame the scenario on fatigue on the pilots because they were flying long distance, and sometimes the military pilots don't have the same criteria like the airliners, where they have to have crew rest, they have to have backup pilots to do this and that. So, and in the meantime, they had received several changes through the Air Force network. Okay, we need you to go here, we need you to go there, which is very common in the Air Force. They're going to say, okay, no, you need to go here, no, you need to go here. As long as they had the fuel requirement to get there, they, they would often change their destinations many times. So, this particular crew was flying from uh, there. So, once again, the Air, the Air Force base that they were supposed to land at, uh, I think it was Patrick Air Force Base, once again, another 10,000 foot runway, and they put it down in a 4,000 foot general aviation airport. <laughs> So, once again, look at this big airplane that's in our little airport. So, fortunately, it didn't crush the runways. They had to call Air Force personnel, come unload the airplane, get it light enough for the air, so another crew could come in and fly it out and get it back to where it needed to be. But they heavily, heavily uh, uh, put the reason uh, on fatigue, uh, circating, you know, your, your body being tired of different time zones and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of this stuff I did get off the internet. So these various pages, and there's probably about 20 or 30 situations of airplanes that landed at the wrong, at the wrong airport. And not only in the United States, in, in, in the, in the uh, Mexico, Europe, stuff like that. And big airplanes from the 19, let's see, 1950s uh, was the oldest one that I see. Uh, and, uh, from from Bombay to London to Montreal, uh, Willow Run, uh, Ypsilanti, Michigan. Uh, uh, let's see, Capital Airlines, if you remember those, are flying DC-3s out of out of Ypsilanti and ended up at the wrong airport. So, like I said, a lot of these are just some of the, the scenarios that have developed over the years. Uh, the FAA, when things like that happen. They put out reports, they have various names for them, to say the contributing factors, uh, who should have done what, the age of the pies, the condition of the pies, if there was any alcohol in, involved in it. Fortunately, there was nothing like that involved in or at least in other cases that I read about. Um, <clears throat> so they investigated quite heavily, and then they'll put out, the NTSB will put out their recommendations to the FAA, so they're, they're two different parties, and sometimes they knock heads a lot because the NTSP thinks that the controllers ought to be doing this, and it's like, don't get in our game, we know what we're doing, and stuff like that. So the NTSB gets, gets their nose kind of crooked out of shape sometimes. But they would put out a lot of uh, um, information, I'll say, to say, well, they should have done this, they should have done that. So, yes, it hasn't happened in four years, but in my book, it shouldn't even be happening at all with all the gadgetry that they've got these days. Um, shouldn't even be talking about it. Uh, here. So 1996, another Atlas, another giant, uh, out in the, let's see where this, down in the Tucson area. So he had mistaken the visual sighting of a runway in between some of those areas that a lot of the GA pilots have been down through the Pinal Airport. So he was going through there, and a lot of airports, whenever they're looking for the runway lights, and there's not a control tower, they have, they have. A, They'll look on their approach plane and they can activate the runway lights by pushing the button three or four or five times. Click, 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 and the runway lights will come on. So, uh, somebody in this particular, in 1996, got a little bit confused and dialed in the wrong frequency to turn on lights. So it turned on the lights at the wrong airport. And it's like, oh, well, we thought that's, I don't know, we're going to go up here. And so, once again, they went to the wrong airport with a big load of cargo. But that's as far as it went. So it didn't make the news and stuff like that. So there's a lot of explanation. Well, we thought we was doing this. We want to do that. Da, 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 da. So it was just kind of, kind of funny in a way how it happened, how it turned out. Uh, so this is the Corpus Christi thing. Uh, so when I talk about the FMSs and things like that, that's kind of what a, like an FMS looks like in a bigger airplane. There's a lot of them that they look at and they program. And some of the, like I said, some of the routes are already pre-programmed into their flight systems through their 
uh, through their, uh, their command centers. So it's not like the pilot has to sit there and redo it. Now back in the 70s and 80s when they had to redo it, it was quite a manual effort in both from the co-pilot and the co-pilot to manually have to load, load all these navigational points as well as the waypoints and the fixes and things to get across the United States or wherever they had to be flying to. And so uh, the um, so a lot of times the, the GA pilots will understand this. The, your identifier, like we heard that one pilot talk about AAO, so when they're, when they're setting up their approach, they're briefing their approach way out, so uh, I'm the pilot, you're the co-pilot, so we gotta go through this exchange of information. Okay, we're gonna cross this fix, we're gonna do this, the inbound heading is this. So we have to confirm with each other that this is our course and we're in agreement. So one of the things that they have to agree upon is the is the Morse code? So every airport that you go into, and if you've got a, an identifying system, it's a your three-letter identifiers: your LAX, your ORD, SAN for San Diego. So there's a Morse code for that. So if you're going to San Diego and you want to identify, you don't just look at it on here. You got to listen for the dot 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 dot. dot you know, just the old-fashioned Morse code is what it is. And you listen to it to your earpiece. You make sure that it, those dot dot dots and dash dash, dash, dash matches what's on that. On that chart, and then you guys are in agreement with, okay, that's 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 the instrument. So you may not even be able to see the runway at this point. You may be on the instrument approach, but you want to make very very sure that you've got the right Morse code lined up for that airport, because you don't want to get down there, down to your decision height, and it's like you came 100 feet, and I don't see nothing except the ocean. So that can become very <clears throat> scary to say the least. Okay, one of those. and let's. So, has anybody got any questions about other, any other questions about ATC or, or things that you wondered about? It kind of covers what I was going to put more into it, but it was just, it could become very boring, um, to say the least. And like I said, on the military, so the military operates a lot of what they call approach controls over the United States. It's not just the FAA has it. They, they have to comply with FAA rules and restrictions and stuff like that. But so they have like Ellsworth Air Force Base for Rapid City. So they have their things that they have to comply with. And once again, their military controllers up at the, at the Rapid City situation is like, why did you give them a visual approach? There was no need for it. Just tell them cross this fix and he's done. But like I said, it's what's done is done. Uh, there was I couldn't see any. Uh, Statements from the military controllers, they were in this, the, what they did put in here was very minimal. Uh, so that's, it was, yeah, it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. No problem. Uh, so this huge aircraft mm -hmm. uh, is coming into a, a major military facility. Yes, sir. And what is, what is the Air Force doing? What? Like I said, I, uh, what they were doing at the time? Yeah. Yeah. So my question too. So midnight shifts typically will start about 10 o'clock at night, most places, not every single, but most places. So you, you got a you got a controller and a supervisor typically on a, on a graveyard shift, whether it's a small little airport, whether it's Chicago, you got that kind of stuff. So what they were doing, I wish I knew, I wish I could tell you, because it was a clear night, there was not even something, okay, if it was a weather factor, it would be something different. But if it was a weather factor, it could have been very, very dangerous for him to be landing at some little airport that he couldn't even see at the time. I was asking, actually, this thing is coming into an Air Force base, mm -hmm. and it comes in and, and lands. I mean, but, but this what, guy, this what's guy, the information that came into the guy's... Oh, I didn't get to see that portion of the audio prior to him getting way out there. But the exchange, the the, the stuff that I saw in print was the, the controller once again said the words that I, I don't like to hear him say, do you see the airport? But I says yes. So now instead of flying on the navigational system that he's got programmed to come in the McConnell, he said, okay, I'll, I'll hand fly it. So I'll take it off the autopilot. I'll just turn a few degrees left because like you said, like you saw in that air, that thing, it was just, that airport was just a little bit left of course from where he was at. And he sees that runway, okay, I'll just go push the nose down a little bit quicker because I'm a little bit too high. And so in the meantime, that guy in the Air Force control tower should have said, you're going to the wrong place. There should have been a warning called a low altitude warning called an LA. And, and it goes beep, 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 beep. So it's not nothing you can, and you can't silence it. 
to, and so what they were doing, I have no idea. I wish I could tell you. Um, so, and once again, that's a, that's a thing that the military airports, why, why they thought they were doing the best thing for the airport, for the airplane, because he had to make a straight in landing anyhow. It wasn't like he was making turns and stuff like that. So the pilot even, or the controller even asked him, did you make a 360 over the airport? You should have been watching. You said, <laughs> no, he landed straight in. He would have crashed if he'd made a, a 360 that low just to get down to that little airport in Jabara Field. And so then you got some little cow hands out there say, hey, <laughs> you're not supposed to be landing out here. So, um, like I said, those things should not have happened. There shouldn't even be anything to be discussing about these days. I There's maybe what he's asking is how come the airliner didn't get shot down at the airport? Thank you. Oh, on, 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 on the Ellsworth, on, okay, yeah. on Delta. Uh, fortunately enough, the, the guys didn't have itchy trigger fingers to do that. They saw it was Delta Airlines, so they had to presume something to was okay, the but they, they knew it was a civilian airplane. It had civilian markings on it. Now, if it had a foreign registry on the back end of the airplane, which then it might click, okay, something really ain't right here. But, they, yeah, yeah, and so fortunately, the... the the investigators, the, uh, the entering party into the airplane with the guns, identified themselves. They said, okay, the crew members. So they took everything very serious. They didn't take it as a joke. So once again, the crew was, or the pilot, the co pilot was escorted off the airplane, and they were detained for a certain period of time and questioned and stuff like that. So they had Delta had to bring in another crew to fly the airplane out of that airport, fly it another six or eight miles, whatever it was, downfield to get to Rapid City. So that was a visual from the Military control Yes, power. yes, a visual approach. And like I said, all this stuff is perfectly legal. They're not making stuff up. They're perfectly legal in doing it. But uh, it doesn't, in the, especially in the commercial, commercial airliners, it really doesn't do any good for them. And, and so the pilots in pretty much anywhere in the United States, they want to be helpful. So whatever the controller asks them, oh, yeah, we see it. Oh, yeah, okay, we'll do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they want to be very helpful even though they should just shut up and say, we prefer the instrument approach. And all they have to do between the two of them, say, and it's part of their checklist, got the airport in sight. That's, that's just the exchange, of, and the, all that's recorded in, in the cockpit. Now, the, the, the one about Ellsworth and Rapid City, so these guys were, like I said, about 72 explicitives, what they couldn't say uh, about all kinds of different things, <laughs> Starbucks, and, few other things that, that oh, this is going to be a bad day. So they knew it right off the get-go, but it was too late to recover the situation safely. So, um, fortunately, the military just made their reports of it. That's pretty much all it went. It made the news a little bit, but it didn't get blown up. Delta didn't need that type of uh, advertisement at the time. So, like I said, that last one was four years ago, and I hope that the controllers will wise up and not have to give these, or not think that they're helping the guys, that they are programmed to do this. It may save them 20 ounces of gas by cutting, making a shortcut for them. It's, but safety-wise, it is never going to over, overcompensate that a couple extra miles of things. It's a strong desire on the pilot's part to actually physically be responsible for landing the airplane and not just going in on auto, and you don't like you don't mean anything as a pilot. Correct. In many cases, they say I'm the macho guy, and I can put that thing down right here, and they'll just come off the autopilot, and they'll talk to about okay, flaps forty, and they're talking, they're making their descent, and they know how to find the airplane, just like a little Cessna down down the runway. It's not a big deal with them. And yes, you're right. There's some, some type of little macho type thing takes place, and they say okay, here's where we're going into, and all of a sudden, oops, you know, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so. Hopefully, whenever next time you take a flight, you don't hear that term, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we, we've landed, <laughs> but maybe not where we want to be. Um, yes, sir. A question, since we have some women pilots here, um, what percentage of uh, pilots in the commercial airline field are women? Very low. Uh, yeah, very low. It's, it's, less, it's probably, what, 2% in, in the whole industry, the whole industry. It's increasing, but it's, okay. it's very low. So maybe what you're saying is later on when there's more women pilots, they won't have the macho instinct. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. I know that um, the lady that made the emergency yeah, that was, 
Yeah. yeah. So, and in, in many of the training scenarios, whether you're a lady pilot, male pilot, whatever, everybody goes through the same type of simulator training. And then, for example, their 737s, they have a huge training facility down in Dallas. And so 95% of your training, of your simulation training time before you even get into the airplane is, is all emergencies. So you don't, typically because you're qualified in the airplane, so they're not going to teach you how to fly the airplane. They want you to know what to do when. And so the instructor will sit in the back of you. These, these simulators that they have these days are, are just cool as anything. They're on what they call six axes. So they can do this, they can do up and down, they can do this, they can do that, and they have all the bells and whistles that make you think that you're physically in the airplane. So I got to fly, I flew a simulator back in 1983 on a DC-10, and even when I turned up the engines, you could feel the vibration going like that. Of the, and, and so as we started taxiing, you could feel the texture of the runway as you were going down. So everything was very real, and that was 1983. So now they've increased it a lot. So like I said, a huge percentage is involving engine out, both engines out, we, uh, we've got flat tires, we've got this, we've got that. And so you're, you're, maybe your three hour simulator time that you might be in, in school for is very intense. Once you come out of there, you're ringing wet. And so if you have boo-booed along the way, it's noted. And in some cases you come back to, to a secondary training to improve that score, so to speak. They have a grading system and you have to pass it whatever this numbering system is to go out and fly your, get in your airplane and fly with a, on your probation. So once you get out of the simulator, it can take usually about 90 days to get out of the simulator, and then they'll put you in, uh, assign you a crew, assign you routes and stuff like that. You're very low in the seniority, typically with any airline, you're on a one-year probation. So any time along that time, if they desert your, your, your captain that you report to, if you, if you goof up and they don't like something, they can have you removed right then, no questions asked. So it's a very intense uh, thing for, for brand new pilots. This lady that was, now it didn't talk about, so now that in, in the Southwest thing, there was two, there's two pilots. So I think it makes it sound like she was the, the command pilot at the time. So I don't know if there was, a, what the co-pilot was doing this thing. But uh, just a couple years ago, I did the presentation on the, the guy landing in the, in the Hudson River. So both these guys were talking to each other the whole time. Not one bit of argument. They both agreed, okay, we're going into the river, even though the co is like, what the crap, we're going into the river? But the captain said, that's where we're going. And that's where they went. Everything went slick and smooth. Everybody was scared to death. But here they are opening up the doors. You're standing out over the Hudson River on the wings of an Airbus. Okay. So uh, once again, the crew coordination is extremely important. That's what they emphasize very heavily in whether you're in flight, whether you're on the ground, whatever you're doing in that airplane, you work as a team, even though you may not like each other, but you've got to work as a team. And whether it's, sometimes if it's, well, I'm trying to figure out how to say this gingerly, even if it's two ladies in the cockpit, and, you know, you get some little attitudes going on back and forth about this and that. Uh, <laughs> say it's not so, right? But just like two men on a bad day, okay, there, there's, no, I don't like that. No, we're not going to do that. So there are a lot of times the captain has to say, okay, what don't you like about it? Okay, we've covered this. So ultimately the captain has to take charge of the situation. And they, they're, they're required to listen, but uh, they come to the agreed upon decision, okay, here's what we're doing. Okay. And sometimes, like in the, uh, in the landing in the Hudson, they had a total of about three minutes to decide what to do before they went into the water. Okay. So, so after they took off, if you can imagine, you're in that airplane and you're sitting with your husband and wife and the grandkids and everybody, okay, we're going down the chart and we're going to see and so and so and so and so. And then about 30 seconds later, the pilot says, prepare for impact. <laughs> so it's like boom, 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 and you're in the water. Yes, sir. Can you tell us a little bit about the guy that landed on the levee? Yes, Taka. Taka is an airline, and Oscar had put that one in there, and that wasn't my things like that have happened a lot, anyhow, but that airplane was coming in from. South America somewhere, it's, a, it's an airline based in El Salvador, and his original intent, I believe, was New Orleans. He got stuck in some bad weather, oh, I forget where, it's out in the, the Gulf of Mexico, and I believe at 20,000 feet or so, I'm not, I can't remember reading the report, the engines flamed out, 
and quit. And so he was basically a 144,000 pound glider and going through the storms and stuff like that. So he had to be, uh, even though he had a little bit of power as he was going through the air, but he had, he had to be able to set up for a perfect glide. And he had no idea at the time. He was looking at some of his instruments because typically when you have a, a, a flame out, a lot of your equipment may not be working. Some of it is, but some of your critical stuff may have went poof. You know, and so now you're just flying along. You're trying to you're, main, you're trying to maintain it cool because you don't want to come down too quick because you, there, there may be an ocean down there. So you're just taking a sweet little time glide then. And so that's what he was doing. And he descended very very smoothly. And instead of landing on concrete, he ended up in a levee. And they had to, they had to tow him out because it was I mean the gears were down in the mud, but everybody walked away from the airplane. So uh, very very talented pie. I forget what year that happened, but that's. Taka was the name of the airline that that happened to. So. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, I. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so on our little placard up there, it says it goes 2,193 miles an hour or something like that. That's what they want you to know that it could go. It could actually go faster than that. So my last couple of years of working, I had the opportunity a lot of times to track airplanes just flying around the world, uh, that type of equipment I had. And so I would see airplanes, and, and typically this airplane would operate at, at, at 60,000 feet and above. And so I would look for targets in, in the range of 60,000 because your airliners can't go that high. Typically the highest they can go is about 45,000 safely. The biz jets can go up to 51. So now these guys are flying in excess of 60,000 feet. So I would put a track, uh, it's a little electronic gadget, and I would follow it as long as I could. And so you'd see, it, it, see 2,600, 2,700, 2,800. So yes, it could go better than Mach 3. I said, no, no, I, I knew that there was only one airplane out there that could kind of even think about going that fast. And it, no, it wasn't an alien. <laughs> so I, I had and so uh, I had a little bit of experience also in Las Vegas. Uh, I, I did some temporary duty up there and got to hear and get briefed on some things I didn't really want to know about. Uh, still to this day, I'm like, why do I know that? But uh, some strange things happen up in the Nevada test range that still make you wonder. A lot of stuff on the internet about various cons conspiracy theories about this and that. But those areas up in what they call Dreamland, Area 51, the Tonopah, Nevada test range do exist. And what they're doing up there all day, I have no idea. But it's, it's pretty well kept secret throughout the years. So anyhow, I hope I've been semi-interesting. Thank you again for everybody coming out. And thank you for everybody's help. Thank you.